Hi, everybody. May 1st, and for the past two, two decades on my news website, earthfiles.com, I have been reporting science, I have been reporting medicine, I have been reporting environmental issues, and in real X Files, I have covered a lot of ground. It has included and still is evolving and ongoing because Earth Files in my reports in news and this Earth Files YouTube channel, I would like to have be the center of my reporting universe now. And that the subjects that I have covered, and you go and look and there's almost uh, 2,800 reports there now, they are, have been about worldwide crop circles, animal mutilations, human abductions, other non-human intelligences in a variety of forms, alien symbols and alien glyphs on ancient archaeologies, military whistleblowers, and advanced extraterrestrial technologies built with what our government describes as self-activating software. I wrote on the back cover of my second book, Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 1, Facts and Eyewitnesses, first released in 1994 and new editions since, quote, We are moving from the paradigm that we are alone in the universe to a new one in which we are not alone and something out there is interacting with us, our animals and our plant life forcing glimpses of other realities upon us, close quote, quoting myself. And at last, I feel there are really, truly cracks in this planet's concocted policies of lies and denials that have been enforced by political and military power brokers for decades, decades, centuries. The cracks are building up to telling the truth that we are not alone in this universe and the cracks keep widening as more and more mainstream media are featuring straightforward articles about other life and even other dimensions and other timelines in the cosmos. Even the head of Harvard University's astronomy department, Avi Loeb, has written several papers about his conviction that the long, strange object called a mua mua that came near our sun and solar system was in fact an extraterrestrial craft. A mua mua was first discovered by the Pan Stars Telescope in Hawaii on October 19, 2017. After it made a sudden hairpin turn as it approached Earth, it accelerated from around 57,000 miles an hour to 97,200 miles an hour on its way out of our solar system without any explanation for that extreme acceleration. Except that Professor Loeb at Harvard has hypothesized in papers that a Muamua was truly an interstellar craft, perhaps checking out this solar system and our Earth. You can read reports about this at my Earth Files News website. All you have to do is go there to www.earthfiles.com and then type in the search bar Oumuamua, Hawaiian. It is spelled O-U-M-U-A-M-U-A. -M -M and you will find some fascinating reports at Earth Files about this strange object. Now, more and more mainstream media are doing straightforward reporting about the growing mainstream physics questions. Are we humans in a holographic universe or one of many universes, many dimensions, and many timelines? Recently came this headline in The Conversation and the Griffith Report. Why the idea of alien life now seems inevitable and possibly imminent. I think it is probable that Earth's human future, many are neutral and some are outright hostile. And that is according to military insiders 
and remote viewers who have worked for the Defense Intelligence Agency, the Central Intelligence Agency, and other agencies trying to understand what is out there in our universe that seems to be based here in our solar system and has been interacting with our planet Earth for literally millions of years. That is why I think that we need honesty from our government about who, what, why are we dealing with on this earth in the alien presences that our government has known about through retrievals of aerial craft and non-human bodies, both dead and alive, since at least the early 1940s. And one of the U.S. government's most important documents that I have ever seen about different types of non-humans and their technologies is this Psalm 101 Majestic 12 Group Special Operations Manual entitled Extraterrestrial Entities and Technology Recovery and Disposal, Top Secret Magic Eyes Only, published by the U.S. War Office. That was before we had a Department of Defense in the Pentagon. In the War Office in April 1954, 65 years ago, and please keep this date in mind that descriptions of non-humans and various types of UFO craft were being written about in Washington, D.C. less than a decade after the end of World War II. And further, this is a manual to teach military security units about how to recover extraterrestrial entities and technologies. It came from a whistleblower in 1994. The document has been scrutinized by my longtime friend and colleague Robert Wood, PhD, an aerospace engineer who first worked for Douglas Aircraft that merged with McDonald Corporation in 1967 to become McDonnell Douglas, which was later purchased by Boeing in the early 1990s. And in Bob's 43 year long career, Bob worked on aerodynamic heating, ballistic missile defense, radar, the space station before his retirement in 1993. And that year, nuclear physicist and UFO researcher Stanton Friedman sent Bob Wood a strip of Tri X 35 millimeter negatives that Stan Friedman had received from Don Berliner at the Fund for UFO Research based in Mount Rainier, Maryland. Berliner said that he received a green box used to ship film and photographs and postmarked March 7, 1994 from a La Crosse, Wisconsin pharmacy. It was later to be identified as Quinlan's Pharmacy. Inside of this pharmacy's photo box were 35 millimeter negatives of what Bob Wood now thinks is the most important and authentic U.S. government document about extraterrestrials leaked to up to 1994 and is up there in the top three or four today as I'm talking to you in, on May 1st, 2019. Bob Wood processed the negatives and eventually assembled each page into what it must have looked like when first printed in the late 1940s to early 1950s. And Bob is convinced after tracking down the original 1954 manager of the war office print, sh print shop that the Psalm 101 training manual uh, was printed on about how to retrieve extraterrestrial bodies and craft. And therefore, from Bob's point of view, after he and Ryan, his son, have been able to communicate directly with that print manager, that this is a real document. The document that this print manager back in 1954 remembered, remembered printing. Tonight, I want to concentrate on three sections and then share with you a discussion that I had last night on the phone with a man whose father knew that at least two extraterrestrial bodies were stored cryogenically at Wright-Patterson in the late 1940s. 
First, let's go through the, quote, description of extraterrestrial biological entities known as Ebers or Ebens, followed by illustrations of extraterrestrial craft, and then the list of where extraterrestrial biological entities, dead and alive, along with their clothing and other materials, were to be taken from the late 1940s onward. We're now looking at page six in this very important Psalm 101 document that is paragraph 10, description of extraterrestrial biological entities. Examination of remains recovered from wreckage of UFOBs, and that was an acronym that was used in the late 40s and early 50s in documents, UFOBs, UFO objects, indicates that extraterrestrial biological entities may be classified into two distinct categories as follows. EBA type 1. These entities are humanoid and might be mistaken for human beings of the oriental race if seen from a distance. They are bipedal, that means they stand on two feet, five foot to five foot four inches in height and weigh 80 to 100 pounds. Proportionally, they are similar to humans, although the cranium is somewhat larger and more rounded. The skin is a pale chalky yellow in color thick and slightly pebbled in appearance. Some people have said it was like a fine-skinned lizard. The eyes are small, wide-set, almond-shaped, with brownish-black irises with very large pupils. The whites of the eyes are not like that of humans, but have a pale gray cast. The ears are small and set low on the skull, the nose is thin and long, and the mouth is wider than in humans and nearly lipless, more like a line, is what everybody says. There is no apparent facial hair and very little body hair, that being very fine and confined to the underarm and the groin area. The body is thin and without apparent body fat, but the muscles are well developed. The hands are small with four long digits, but the muscles, but no opposable thumb. The outside digit is jointed in a manner as to be nearly opposable, and there is no webbing between the fingers as in humans. The legs are slightly but noticeably bowed, and the feet are somewhat splayed and proportionally large. Now, EBA type 2. These entities are humanoid but differ from type 1 in many respects. They are bipedal, standing on two feet, but these are smaller, three and a half, three feet five inches to four feet two inches in height and weigh 25 to 50 pounds. Look around a room to look at a desk, something that is about three feet, three and a half. They would be no taller than 3.5 to 4.2 inches. Proportionally, the head is much larger than humans of type 1 Ebens, these cranium being much longer and elongated. The eyes are very large, slanted, and nearly wrap around the side of the skull. This is talking about these smaller Eba 2. These would be the ones with the large of slanted black eyes. They are totally black with no white showing. There is a noticeable brow ridge and the skull has a slight peak that runs over the crown. The nose consists of two small slits which sit high above the slit-like mouth. There are no external ears. The skin is a pale bluish gray color being somewhat darker on the back of the creature and is very smooth and fine-celled. There is no hair on either the face or the body, and these creatures do not appear to be mammalian. The arms are long in proportion to the legs. In fact, I know from uh, descriptions and illustrations, the fingers 
fall all the way down to these small creatures' knees, and that the hands have three long tapering fingers and a thumb, which is nearly as long as the fingers. Therefore, they look like they have four long fingers. The second finger is thicker than the others, but not as long as an index finger. The feet are small and narrow, and four toes are joined together with a membrane. It is not definitely known where either type of creature originated, but it seems certain that they did not evolve on Earth, and it is further evident, although not certain, that they may have originated on two different planets. Brad, come back to me for just a second before we go to the next one. What I wanted to stress is when you have a, a, in the cattle mutilations, in the scenes, I've seen photographs, were little prints that went round like this and came back like an ice cream cone. Ranchers and sheriffs have said it looked like little ice cream cone prints in some places of animal mutilations. I think if you take the impressions in dusty soil and you apply those words of skin around what would have been toe bones coming back, that it could be that what was at those mutilation sites is exactly like EBA type 2 in the Psalm 101 document uh, for the War Department having to do with extraterrestrial biological entities retrieved by our military. Now, let's go to the next slide. This is very important. This is what was operational in 1954 as the types of craft that our government was gaining knowledge about that included in the upper left three types of disks, sort of lens shaped. And then to the right, it is what, if you were looking down on one, it would be circular. The lens would be thinner. And then that's, that's what the disk would look like. Below that, is a long cigar-shaped craft with a series of what looked like windows or portholes going along the side. They had defined those two, or the cigar, into two types, uh, have a smaller drawing that they called an airfoil. And when they added to the airfoil, they said could be triangular, meaning that you might see a side or the back of something that could be confused, possibly, with the cigar shape that they knew that there were both. And down below, they show a triangular craft, now from the bottom looking up, and there are those three lights, the center light, and for those of you who know about the Belgium craft that were photographed for at least two years at the beginning of the 90s, this there's even a photo that would look like this drawing, but what I'm trying to avoid is mixing any of the modern stuff for you all to see. This is drawn in a 1954 printed war office training manual. And if it's being printed in 1954, it is based on data that precedes 1954, and we don't know if there had been other editions of this training manual, but that advanced triangle is there in that 1954 document. And then to the left, some people in the abduction syndrome over the years have referred to ice cream cone shaped shift. And I think this 1954 manual I think on the left of the triangle is possibly what abductees have meant when they said it reminded me of an ice cream cone. This document uses the word cone shaped and that at the bottom 
uh, and in another part of this uh, manual, it says that the triangle is considered to be a highly more advanced type of aircraft than the others, but it doesn't go into the reasons why. Now, let's go to Psalm 101, page 11. Extraterrestrial Technology Classification Table. And this is where the military units that would be assigned to go out and do these missions of retrieval and return and how to box everything up and how to handle it. Where would all of this material go? And it breaks it down and you can see that the top, the aircraft, intact devices, a damaged device, power plants, identified fragments, unidentified fragments would all be going to Area 51 S4. And this is a reference, this is a manual printed in 1954. Then, number seven on the list, supplies and provisions, non-mechanical or non-electronic materials of a support nature, such as clothing, personal belongings, organic ingestibles, and so on. Majestic 12 code for supplies and provisions, SP331, and where did they go? What was the facility that received that? Blue Lab Wright Patterson hyphen 61. Number eight, living entity, living non-human organisms in apparent good or reasonable health. In MJ-12 codes, EBA-010, and they go to OPNAC BBS-01. That's related to the Navy. It's never been clear exactly where that facility is, but the next one, ninth on the list, non-living entity, deceased, that means dead. Deceased, dead, non-human organisms or portions of organisms, organic remains and other suspect organic matter. The code was EBA dash X is an X-ray, O is an orange, and they were designated in 1954 to go to the Blue Lab at Wright-Patterson dash 61. So now we have Wright-Patterson associated with getting dead bodies and all of the materials, clothing, everything that would go with those dead bodies to Wright-Patterson. Yesterday, on April 30th, I found this email that you're looking at now in my email from a man who has given me permission to use his real name and his father's real name, which was Alan Hale Jackson. He worked 36 years in aerospace related engineering in Columbus, Ohio, not far from the historic and famous Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And the emailer is Jeffrey Jackson from Columbus, Ohio where he has lived his entire 52 years. And his father, Alan Hale Jackson, was based out of Columbus, Ohio, not far from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And he writes, quote, Linda, I heard you on Ground Zero, and that was Monday night, April 29th this week, telling of the autopsies of aliens in the late 1940s. That is something that Clyde Lewis and I got to talking about. And Jeffrey Jackson continues, and here is information I know as true. My father, Alan Hale Jackson, worked 36 years at Curtis Wright and North American and Rockwell and then for Boeing. 
He was a manager who expedited parts. He knew of many persons, both civilian and military Air Force personnel, that had told him of multiple aliens in deep freeze in Dayton at Wright Pat all throughout his 36-year career. He passed away in 2016 at age 86. I am his only child, Jeff Jackson. Thank you for all you do for truth. And now I'm going to play for you. Jeffrey Jackson talking to me last night on the phone about his father, Alan Hale Jackson, having firsthand knowledge from a flight surgeon called in to consult at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in 1973 to 74 about two gray-skinned extraterrestrial bodies being preserved at Wright-Patterson consistent with the Psalm 101 manual and that there was a characteristic or lack of characteristics that was baffling to everyone dealing with them and they had called in a flight surgeon. And here now is Jeffrey Jackson. At the age of about eight in 1976, my father had been employed at Curtis Wright starting in 1952. And at age he started to discuss the aliens that were in deep freeze at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Where were you? What time was it? How did this conversation begin? Every day, my dad would work nights, and then when he would get up in the morning, he would go out into the backyard and uh, kind of like toss the ball with me after school because he would have to go to work at 6 p.m., and we were on the back porch, and he had told me that there were some things that he had learned from a doctor in the Air Force that he had been kind of acquainted with about the beings being stored there at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. There were two beings. They were gray in color, very heavy for their size, and they couldn't determine the sex or whether they even had a sex, unisex or no sex at all. And that's why this colonel was telling my dad about it at Rockwell. And what was your father doing at Rockwell? He started at Curtis Wright in 1952 and worked on the Vestal short takeoff landing aircraft. And then when it changed to Rockwell, he managed the parts for the Hellfire missile. And then as that progressed into the B-1B bomber, that was about the time when uh, 76 to 78 they did all their operations here in Columbus, Ohio, and they answered up to uh, Palmdale, California, where their bosses were. Why would the doctor be talking to your father? He did the physicals at the plant at Rockwell and had become acquainted with my father through my uh, mother. My mother was a piano and accordion teacher, and he took piano and accordion prior to going to Vietnam and serving as a captain in the U.S. Air Force. His name was Dr. Gary Frydenberg, and he's buried here in Columbus, Ohio, in a Jewish cemetery. He was a captain in the Air Force that went to Vietnam, and then he was called in to Wright-Patterson to do some consulting on how to handle the bodies and how to care for them. He was brought in to determine what the sex was, and how to best preserve them. They were in some sort of liquid ice fluid, as my dad described it, which I believe now maybe could have been like cryogenic fluid or liquid nitrogen. They were very small, but heavy for their size. And did anybody determine why? I'm not sure. Do you remember your father talking about the details of them? They were gray in color. They had no eyelids. They seemed to have some sort of uniform on, but they couldn't tell their male or female characteristics. And did they talk about the possibility that these were clones or hybrids or androids? Not to my knowledge. And so troops and military units, special ops that could go out and retrieve craft and bodies. And if 
As some military people have told me, our government began to suspect that they weren't even legitimate crashes in all cases, that it was a bit like a Trojan horse plant, maybe to get specific physics, specific engineering in front of humans to try to guide us along certain developments in aerospace and other science and technologies. Are these truly friendly, helpful Ebens? Many people who have been remote viewers and working in the government say, yes, the Ebens are friendly. They are our allies. Other people raise the question, why? Why are they our allies if others are neutral and others are hostile? That is what I am trying to understand hard in my work now. Because no matter what is the reason for friendly, neutral, and hostile, all of us need, as a human family on the surface of this earth, to understand who cohabits with us on earth, because I have no question that there are cohabitors. But are they the friendlies or the neutrals? I would doubt that they were the hostiles, but you never know. It's only having knowledge. It's only if all of us understand what the government knows and is either concerned about, enthusiastic about, why we are trying to get to the moon and Mars and out into the solar system now. That is, to me, that is fundamental and profound knowledge that we all deserve to know and to have. It's one of the reasons why I'm doing the Earth Files YouTube channel and Earth Files in the work that I do. And that it is encouraging to me that more and more of you, like Jeffrey, did yesterday and did the uh, recording with me last night on the record with his name, his father's name, and the flight surgeon's name. If we could get more people feeling comfortable to try to share their firsthand knowledge, then maybe on our own as a human population who deserves to know the truth, maybe there will be more and more cracks and I welcome any and all of you as Whistleblowers Anonymous or as people like Jeffrey to come forward and talk on the record. His father has passed, the flight surgeon has passed, his mother has passed. So it is not like he's violating anything on their behalf. He's helping you and me and all of us to understand that we truly have had alien bodies, bodies that were baffling because there was no sexual identification as humans would define male and female. And there comes this other big, huge subject. Were those two clones? Probably. Hybrid, hybridized clones? Combinations of something? The development of identical cloned androids that were biological robots? These are now serious questions that are ongoing on our planet right now. There are geneticists who are trying to understand what is the truth about Homo erectus up to Homo sapiens sapien? How much hybridization and manipulation by outside intelligences have evolved us to where we are now. And if we are purposefully and deliberately manipulated, as the government document that I was shown at Kirtland Air Force Base here in Albuquerque back in April of 1983 said, extraterrestrial biological entities manipulated DNA in already evolving primates to create Homo sapien. This story is so big. It is not just about, are we alone in the universe? It's not just about who is friendly, who is neutral, who is 
hostile. It's who are you, who am I, who are we on this planet that revolves around this particular yellow sun and a solar system that we seem to be in a garden in the Milky Way galaxy where there are a whole bunch of other yellow suns similar to ours. How much of the life involved with our planet and our solar system is within 40 light years from this planet? And was Earth sought out specifically because it is a big watery planet at a 93 million miles from the sun, not too hot, not too cold, and that what it has served for at least 270 million years, as that DIA analyst told me back in 1999, this planet has been perceived as a great place to be a laboratory, to test genetics, to harvest materials, to manipulate and terraform. And maybe if we can survive ourselves in this 21st century and we are given the truth about ourselves in relationship to other life in the universe and that this planet Earth is so special, is so extraordinary, is a true laboratory. And maybe we'll come out on the other side of this difficult and struggling intersection that we're in right now. If we're given the respect to be told the truth, that we're not alone in this universe, that this headline comes out sometime soon and all the reasons are lined up, then maybe it will finally be the energy, the pressure that will make humanity come together exactly as Ronald Reagan speculated about in the 1980s. If we knew that there were other intelligences and all was not peaceful, then humans would look at each other as brothers and sisters that we could work together to protect each other, this struggling earth, moving out into the solar system as one family, not a family of war, but a family of peace that is taking off finally with the truth and moving out into the solar system. What I've just described, I guess, is my own fantasy and dream, but that's the way I hope we evolve. And I know from the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of emails that I'm getting from all of you that there's so many of you who feel the same way frustrated on being on a planet where there is so much war and not fully understanding why war continues to fester. And maybe all of this that I've been sharing with you tonight is at the root of something that is significantly profound about why we are on Earth in the first place and why there have been conflicts. And as the Defense Intelligence Agency agent told me in December of 1999 that not only had three competing extraterrestrial civilizations been working in this laboratory Earth for at least 270 million years, but that World War II was an extraterrestrial war fought through human bodies. May God in the divine field help every human consciousness to get past being manipulated by forces and intelligences we have neither understanding of, nor are they in our daily lives, but they may have more to do with what is happening on our planet than anything that we see in news headlines. And so, Let's keep coming together at my Earth Files YouTube channel. Uh, all of you, please keep telling everybody you know 
to keep subscribing to the Earth Files YouTube channel so we can keep growing and growing as a voice, hopefully as a worldwide voice on this planet. And that uh, I would like to throw this now to uh, dear Lori to see what kind of questions that you all might have tonight. Of course, but the first thing I would like to mention is a big thank you to all of the amazing Super Chats that we've received today. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. And the thousands of comments about how amazing your shirt looks. <laughs> thank you so much. This is this really is, uh, is kind of wonderful news to me because I wondered if I should wear something that was had stripes in it. I've, this is my probably my most favorite uh, dress up blouse and uh, wearing it tonight uh, I I really do like it and I'm so glad to hear that all of you do and I will now wear it again without hesitation <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I thought you'd like to hear that yes. so here is our first question Linda why are we pushing so hard to get back to the moon yes Okay, this is a personal opinion based on a lot of off-the-record discussions. And part of the off-the-record discussions is another Navy SEAL, not in my videos. Brad and I are working very hard on part four, by the way, which we will be screening this month of May. This is another Navy SEAL who because of my work, because I have been reaching out to other whistleblowers. Let me know that what Spartan One has told me in my backlighted voice alter video from his point of view is quite accurate about Antarctica and that he also knows that inside of our moon, are alien artifacts, alien technologies, and that most likely our moon has been useful and used like an instrument, like an observation instrument by non-human intelligences for millennia. It might be that the signal now, the development of the Space Force, the rush to get to the moon, the rush to get to Mars, I hope, is part of what the other Navy SEAL, not on video, reinforced for me. He said, we do have allies that are helping us. And that if we have allies, it may be that there is some stake by the allies in helping humanity get past this difficult hump in the timeline of the world. And the difficult hump is getting over centuries and centuries of conditioning by conflicting forces that have made us think that we are the only life in the universe and that there was something to be gained. There was vested interest in keeping humans dumb and blind about our universe and our role in it, and our relationship to other life forms. That secrecy, being hidden from us, has served the non-human intelligences too when they wanted it. So maybe what is happening is that we have enough help now that whatever else is out in the universe, that we now have confidence that we can go back to the moon, we can have bases, we can stay on the moon, we will have humans all uh, working there full time in maybe some kind of cyclic rotation with Earth. Others have told me that that has been happening for a long time, that at least since the 1970s, that we have had uh, rotational missions that have been based in some kind of a mission base on the moon, and that that is related to why we want to get to Mars. And that is related to the 
still unproven, but described by several people to me, that on Mars in the Northern Hemisphere, in Cydonia where there is that big carved head, it is not a trick of light and shadow as NASA tried to convince us uh, from the Viking photo. That is a big carved head. Is it of Anunnaki? Is it of humanoids from some place in the 40 year light year zone around us? Is it from some place further? Who exactly is that big large head with the big pyramid? There's no question from other people that I've talked to, our, our government has known uh, all along that structure. Do we know precisely who is behind that structure, who made it, and then what about John Brandenburg's hypothesis as a nuclear physicist that there might have been two hydrogen bombs a million, two million, three million years ago in one of these extraterrestrial conflicts that had a compression wave on Mars and destroyed a lot of Cydonia? If that happened, as John Brandenburg in his book, Death on Mars, said we would be going to Mars for archeological dig purposes to look for the civilization that was there a million, two million, three million years ago that might have been uh, defeated or stunned or killed or whatever happened by something that came and hurt Mars. All of this is in the category of science speculation, philosophical speculation, observational speculation. And that may be why if Elon Musk or whoever's going to do this, that there's a time pressure to get to Mars now at this particular juncture. We're going to have a base on the moon and from the moon, and this is another important part, I've covered a lot of this at Earth Files. You can find reports about Project Starshot. We are actively trying to get laser technology that could be the energy for small wafer craft, like sending an iPhone inside of something protective. Launch it to Alpha Centauri, uh, 4.2 light years from Earth. Uh, and while it's launching at maybe 30% the speed of light and could get there in 17 or 18 years, we would continue launching more and more at getting, trying to get to the speed of light. And if we were able to propulse something close to the speed of light, we would get something getting to Alpha Centauri in four years instead of 17 or 20 years. And that would pass probably at some point anything we were sending. So this would be like uh, in uh, 20 years, we might have a bunch of these mini craft that are sent there by laser that would start passing the slower ones. But how would we get the information back? So there are a lot of different avenues now where our government and scientists are working on projects that would get us information about Alpha Centauri, Proxima B planet there, maybe too close to the sun, there may be prominences that would destroy life. They're trying to figure that out. Mars is our closest planet sized object where humanity could start separating itself out into other colonies because who knows whatever is going to happen on Earth. And having bases on Mars, bases on, on the moon, uh, branching out beyond, it may be that non-humans themselves have been trying to inspire our government that life is not guaranteed in this universe anywhere that there are all kinds of catastrophes. If a gamma ray star blew within a certain range, our entire solar system would be fried. Everything would be gone. So 
I am trying to the best of my ability as an investigative journalist who has always my, my m most read <laughs> subjects since I was four years old has been about astronomy, science, um, I'm interested in medical advancements, uh, trying to help this planet with the environment. That, those are my concerns. And that's why I ended up the last 40 years trying to understand what was behind the animal mutilations, so bloodless, trackless, and strange, that led um, within a short period of time of a year to human abductees, all of law enforcement saying the perpetrators are creatures from outer space. And now it's 2019, and it's no longer a question in my mind. It's no longer a question in the military whistleblower's mind. It's no longer a question in scientists, especially a physicist who's talked to me in great depth about so many facets. And that's what I'm hoping that there will be an Earth Files YouTube channel and I will be saying my open, yay, the headline is broken. It's now official. We're not alone in this universe and it opens up a trillion chapters to unfold on the unknown. Now, it's almost 8.30. Is there one more question and I'll try to answer it more shortly, but this, all of this tonight all kind of fits together in this big, big picture of 270 million plus years up to this day and going forward. Okay, so what we have now is a couple of questions. I think all of them are probably too long, but I'm going to let you judge. So we've got, who does Linda think that we were created from? Anunnaki's, Greys, or Ebens? And then we have a question. Do you believe that cryptids like Bigfoot are actually extraterrestrials? What do you want to take? I can take both of them and do them this way. The Sasquatch, as far as I know, is an extraterrestrial hybridized creature made by extraterrestrials to work specifically on this planet Earth, in this gravity, in this atmosphere, to do some kind of work that is not clear and that its habitat has always been underground. Whether it is in North America or if it is in Laos and Vietnam or in the Himalayas, wherever they have been, and they, there really are uh, Yowies in Australia, they are underground creatures they have a direct relationship with one or more of the non-humans. And the reason that I feel firmly about that is how many are come into discussions when you are talking with people in the abduction syndrome and they have seen the Sasquatch Bigfoot on a craft. And then there is that very famous sheriff's, uh, Great Falls, um, Montana, the Cascade County Sheriff's Office, the report that says right in the report, going back to 1976, I believe it was, Keith Wolverton was the deputy. I talked with him about this. A rancher calls up the Sheriff's Office and says that he was going out hunting, had a 30 6 rifle, comes around on the path, standing in front of him is this, he thought at least eight foot, maybe taller, reddish brown, and he called it in the report, a gorilla. He took his 30 6 without hesitation and shot, and this huge hairy creature disappeared in a flash of light. I've seen the document, a flash of light. Well, that's not purely organic, or it is a hybridized being made specifically for work on this planet that has a technology that we don't know about, and it can just push it and psh, goes into another dimension or whatever they do. Now, who could be responsible for Homo erectus 
two million years ago, the small Lucy who stood up, a, a primate who stood up for the first time. And then, that's one question. Which intelligence, the Anunnaki seemed to fall in that category. They wanted something that would not be very bright, mostly strong, be able to work on Earth in this gravity and this atmosphere, go down deep into gold mines and get gold for those ETs. The Anunnaki, as far as I know, were pure blood ETs from some place else in the Milky Way galaxy. The interesting thing is that not all academics accept Anunnaki as anything but mythology. Why is that? So you, you always have these clouds and fogs of dispute. My guess is that the pure blood humanoid Anunnaki, maybe with a reptilian blood, not known for sure, are the ones who needed worker bees on this planet, and that's how Homo erectus came about. Over two million years, in all of the different primate, standing up primate, evolving to Homo sapien, there was a man in the government who told me that when they were finally able, through Project Sigma, to communicate uh, telepathically with the gray Ebens with intent, meaning Q and A, Q and A, and they could do it successfully. That one of the uh, puzzles to the Eben that it expressed to whoever in our government was doing the telepathic Q and A was the gray being said that they didn't understand why there were so many different types of humans on the earth when they had been involved in only one particular experiment. And that that experiment was supposed to have been the creation of what we called the Mayans. They took those Mayans to another planet. It is supposed to be functioning and that the Ebens are famous for doing this. In the briefing for Ronald Reagan, March 6 to 8, 1981, he was given a list of five ETs that our government was doing a briefing for him as the brand new president. The top of the list, the Ebens, the ones that are considered to be allies. The next two on the list, Archaloids and Quadloids, were hybrids made with combinations and that the Ebens took those and put them on completely different solar systems and planets and that the a government guy talking to me about this said the implication to him was that the Ebens are extremely advanced and the way they claim territory in the Milky Way galaxy and beyond is by constantly making hybrid, hybridized, and then are they in the category of androids, hybridized independent beings, hybridized clones. It, that you can keep subdividing, but that they make different life humanoid forms with different levels of intelligence for different planetary systems extending the Ebens territory throughout the Milky Way galaxy and beyond. And I can grasp the strategy that in a universe that is 13.8 billion light years in age and expanding so fast that you can imagine if you're advanced enough to move point to point, bend space, time, go wherever you want, that you might not want doing that and you might just continue creating all kinds of hybrid, hybrid, hybrids to put all over the garden of the Milky Way galaxy 
and that simultaneously claims your territory. These are the kinds of things I hope. I would, wouldn't you like to see six o'clock news breaking and a panel not about human politics, but a panel of non-humans working through translators and people we could trust who would start telling us the truth about what is the original panspermia planting of the double helix spiral DNA on planet Earth by who? And then, who came in what succession, over what timeline, mixing and matching genes of all sorts of life forms? And then, extraterrestrial biological entities manipulated DNA and already evolving primates, Lucy, Africa, to create Homo sapien. That's you. That's me, that's all of us. So how many on earth now are someone else's hybrids? And what difference does it make? Because we are on a planet where we have got to learn who we are and to work and live together, or we may not make it into the 21st century. And on that note, I'm gonna say good night. I'm just Wonderful to have all of you here, and I look forward to next Wednesday.